Hello historians, today we're going to be talking about the 1960s. I want to mention that what we see when we picture the 1960s isn't really the early 1960s. So somewhere around 1964, 1965, we started getting that turbulence that we envision. So what we see as the 60s kind of is like 1965 to 1974. So at first the 1960s were a lot like the 1950s. If you want a really in good indication of when it changed, look at the Beatles. So very early 1960s, they're, I want to hold your hand and love me do and clean cut Suit, suit and tie at performances, and then their hair grows long, they start changing their sound, and you get, I am the walrus. So, <laughs> if you look at the art and the music of the time, we can start seeing this, where we went from this optimism and better living through chemistry mindset to there's things wrong. So as I said, we started out the 60s in this really great state of optimism. We won the war, we won the First and Second World War. We've got vaccinations, we've got pesticides, people are living longer, they're healthier, they're happier. Um. Money's chugging in, we've got this good economy happening. And we elected um, John F. Kennedy. He put in place this new frontier. There's hope for renewal and there's change. Um, his 1960s campaign was a new generation of leadership, a new man to cope with the problems and new opportunities. He was a war hero. And he's proclaiming a torch has been passed, this new generation of America, his home. And by extension, his administration was referred to as Camelot. And we're coming into this great new era. If you look down here at the popular vote, he ran against um, Richard Nixon. And I'd like to encourage you to watch the Kennedy-Nixon debate. Because, remember, Nixon made his name as an anti-communist. He was going to defend America. And Kennedy was this, we're going to make everybody healthier, happier, safer. And when you watch these debates, well, first, if those people that were listening to the debates on the radio thought Nixon had won, he was articulate, he was intelligent, he was coming up with all these policies that he sounded very presidential. The people who are watching the debates on TV had the opposite take. Kennedy won these debates. He was cool, he was collected. He was using this new media of television. I mean, television had been out for a while, but it still wasn't the way we got politics at the time. So now it was starting to become that and he came in and he put on some face makeup. Okay, his staff put makeup on him. And he looked presidential. Whereas if you watch through the debates, Nixon's getting sweatier and more tired looking. And so it was the sway of the way people were consuming media that gave Kennedy a push. Besides, he was a handsome, charismatic, like really photogenic man. So he had an edge. And we're seeing the beginnings of the Dixocrats. If you look at that map with the purple, those are Southern Democrats who were getting really unhappy that the Democratic Party has decided that there should be integration, that there should be African Americans with equality, right to vote, um, integrated schools. And so the Dixocrat party was starting to pull away. We're gonna see this in the Johnson election where 
Strom Thurmond runs as a Dixocrat, and he pulls all the vote, well, all that Southern block of votes away from the Democratic Party. This, remember, we have this optimism thing. We are in the space race. So it really started when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik. It was about the size of a basketball. They launched it into orbit, and this satellite went over the United States. It's not that it was a basketball-shaped thing going over the United States. It was the problem. It was whoever can launch these things into orbit will be able to, well, if they can launch the satellite, they could potentially launch missiles that far. It was then a race for air superiority. And so we didn't want to say, hey, we're in this, We well, we knew we were in the Cold War, but we didn't want to say, hey, we're going to try to do this so we can have better missiles and because we're scared that they have they're going to have really good missiles so we we want to be the first country to launch people into orbit around the earth we want to be the first people to go to the moon these are noble good exploratory goals and we thought okay this is good we should all work for this but in the background untalked about for the most part was the fact that this was part of who has the better military advantage here so the space race um was happening during kennedy's time i will see about linking the um the kennedy speech we do this and the other thing, not because they're easy, but because they are difficult. It's a really great speech on why we're going to be the first to the moon. But this time of optimism, was starting to fade. November 63, our great leader, this charismatic hero was assassinated. Um, Warren Commission said one lone gunman. There's people arguing and arguing that it wasn't. We just don't have evidence. So this picture in the top um, right corner is Mrs. Kennedy still wearing the clothing she was wearing when her husband was shot as President Johnson is now sworn in to office. It's a pretty painful counter picture seeing those two next to each other. So this started cracking our national psyche. We, they, they say that everybody that was alive then and old enough to think knew where they were when Kennedy was shot. Just the same way everybody in my generation remembers when the Twin Towers were attacked. So this was a critical, crucial moment in our nation's psyche. So Lyndon Johnson was following Kennedy's policies. Actually, originally, because he's from Texas, he was a segregationist. And over time, so his early career, he voted segregationist policies and he started changing his mind. And so then Kennedy chose him because he was an integrationist Southerner. Okay, good choice. Because he was hoping to draw that vote. And then when Johnson gets to be president, he actually did more for civil rights and integration than Kennedy actually got to do. So his policy then was the Great Society. It envisioned a sweeping plan to improve the lives of all Americans. Sounds good. He ran against Goldwater. Oh, speaking of changing minds, when um, Hillary Clinton was a young teenager, she actually campaigned for the Republican Goldwater. It's just 
people can change their opinions. They can change their mind with new experiences. It's not flip-flopping. It's actually gathering data and changing based on the new data. That's science. Okay. So, yeah, Johnson did great. But I'm not going to say he was the greatest human being ever. If you look at this picture in the top bottom right corner, he had a habit of being very persuasive by getting bigger, you know, like angry cats. He actually would physically get closer and stand up over people as a way of unsettling them and having them back down so he could win arguments. So, it worked. In 1964, um, Johnson was supporting a war on poverty, empowering the poor to be able to bring themselves out of poverty. And possibly the most important thing he did during his administration is in 1965, he put in place Medicare and Medicaid. So senior citizens and those who can't afford medical care can get it. He also helped put in place um, the Housing and Urban Development um, HUD. That logo comes off as fascist to me. I personally don't like the logo, but that's an aesthetic choice. He um, helped with federal financial aid, which many of you were on. I know I benefited from it. Um, he abolished the early quota system for immigration. And if you look at the bottom um, left corner, you can see that he's styling himself after Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal ideas. He's pushing those ideas further and further and further. He took Kennedy's ideas and kept going with them. He takes um, Roosevelt's New Deal stuff and goes with it. This is a time, the 1960s are when the civil rights movement really got traction to be a huge national movement. I mean, Brown vs. Education was 1954. Um, school integration um, conflicts were happening during the Eisenhower administration. I mean, they were happening in the 50s. It had been happening before that. But the 1960s is when it got big. And one of the important leaders was Medgar Evers. And I'm betting a lot of you haven't heard of him. He was an NAACP field agent, and he was murdered, of course he was, by white segregationists, and it took, from the 1960s, someone was finally convicted in 1994 of his murder. It took a long time for him to get justice. A Supreme Court case had said that Bus segregation is illegal. And these interstate buses that go from state to state, that's under the Interstate Commerce Clause, and it's not in the country's best interest to try to enforce segregationist policies in random states. We're not doing it. So pushing that, young black and white people got on these buses and traveled around through the segregationist South, and they were beaten. They were arrested. In this picture, you see a bomb had been thrown into this bus. So this is um, May 14, 61. Um, there was a mob of 200 people. They threw the bomb in. As people ran out, they were beaten. And um, the Birmingham Public Safety Commissioner Bull Connor didn't even bother to send police. So it was pretty horrible. Um, if you look at this picture in the bottom left corner, this is a form of peaceful protest. Um, it was lunch counter sit-ins. An African American would go sit down at the lunch counter in a segregated um, area and say, man, have a cup of coffee. And the protester would refuse to move until they were served. Of course, they weren't served. And 
you see the hostile violence around this young man in the picture. So young men and women were risking their lives. This is when people were still being lynched for trying to vote. Lynched being murdered by mobs for doing something simple as making a political statement, um, trying to vote. Um, oh, that poor child. Oh, one, one 14 year old Emmett Till, he supposedly whistled at a white woman. Turns out like 50 years later, she said, yeah, he didn't even whistle at me. And her relatives took him to the swamp and beat him to death for allegedly whistling at a woman. So these people in the freedom rides at the lunch counter protest, making political speeches, these brave men and women were risking their lives at every moment they were doing this. I can't even describe the bravery. And there's two civil rights leaders that you may never have even heard about, James Baldwin and Baynard Rustin. And the reason that you haven't heard about them is because they were openly homosexual men in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Um, so, uh, um, Rustin tells a story about he was on those Freedom Ride buses. He was traveling around and he got arrested and was, I think, spent 22 um, days on a chain gang for sitting in the wrong part of the bus in a segregationist state. What he says is, if they had known the white man sitting next to me was my partner, it would have been a lot worse than time in jail. So, um, he was very active. Rustin was very, very active. He's the one or one of the couple people that were planning the war march on Washington. This was him. When the um, Montgomery bo bus boycotts happened, he was 44 and Dr. King was only 22 or 25, sorry. And he helped mentor Dr. King. He helped get um, funding from his organizations in New York and Northern Money to help fund Dr. King's speeches. He was critical to the civil rights movement, but there were anti-integrationists and of course anti-communists because Rustin was originally with the Communist Party, but he became disillusioned with them later. But he had communist leanings. He was always a democratic socialist. So Strom Thurmond and other anti-integrationists um, knew that he was a homosexual. He had never been closeted. And they started spreading rumors that he and Dr. King were in an affair. Um, and they, like, if you don't back down, if you have this march on Washington, we're going to tell everybody that this is a homosexual movement and we're going to ruin it. So he stepped back into the shadows on the march to Washington. He did make a speech, but his leadership role was diminished. Um, there was, this was a really important moment. This, I have a dream speech, um, of course got heard through the country. It showed the numbers. And of course it had the respectability. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois had just died, but he was involved with this movement. Um, Dr. King became the, um, the public face of it all. Um, Randolph from the Sleeping Car Porters Union, he was a, one of the leaders of this. It had a very strong presence. So that was in August of 63, a couple months before Kennedy was assassinated. And I'm going to link Dr. King's speech because everybody should hear it if you haven't yet. And I want you to see what the protesters were up against.
this is one of the better um, counter protest signs, one of the less um, crude, evil, rude. It's still pretty horrific, but this is what they were up against. And this whole time, the going into the South and trying to recruit people to vote was part of Freedom Summer. It, so this was 1964, um, the voter registration project in Mississippi. And of course, let me see. I'm just going to read what I have here. Um, in June 64, the first 300 um, arrived. The next day, um, two of the white students that were trying to help um, register African Americans in the South to vote, Schwarmer and Goodman, both from New York, and James Cheney, an African American man, disappeared. I can't remember if they actually found their bodies or not, but those um, young men were murdered for trying to help African Americans register to vote. So do you guys remember when there was an incident where the police uh, beat an unarmed um, suspect and riot broke out? And then you're going to ask, which of those events was it? Because, yeah, this is part of a much larger reoccurring pattern. When I was in high school, I was sitting at my homecoming dance while there was riots going on near my parents' house in Miami. Um, so that was 1992, possibly 91, and that was the Rodney King riots. But And there was one a couple of years back, and of course, the Watts riots were really, really horrific. So, um, this was August 11th to 16th, so several days in 1965, two white policemen um, scuffled with a black motorist suspected of drunk driving. Spectators attacked when they saw what they seen as racially motivated abuse. Because why are you beating an unarmed suspect. But these riots left 34 dead, over 1,000 injured, and 4,000 arrested. But once again, this is part of something bigger. This had been going on for decades before. It went on through the 60s. It was race riots could break out at any time during the 1970s. And we're still getting this. And I know there are people who disagree with the Black Lives Matter movement, but ask yourself before anybody damns this organization, ask what they're actually protesting against. So how can one address that there has been police brutality? Um, Mr. Garner, who was... Um, his lungs were squished by police officers, he had been asked to leave. He was trying to be arrested, and like Rosa Parks, he's like, no, I'm tired of this. His crime was selling loose cigarettes. So what is the protest? What's the right thing to do? Yes, the vast majority of police are good, honorable, noble people. People don't tend to go into the job thinking, well, I'm going to be a bad guy, and I'm going to target people I don't like. No, the majority of officers are good. So we need better training, we need better screening processes for police officers, but what is the argument? Why do these riots keep happening on regular cycles over and over? And looking at the history might put us in a better position to understand what's going on today. And that's the whole point of learning history is what is the context? What is the argument about, and how did we get here? In response to racial violence, to inequality, to the myriad of problems that have been happening at this time, the Black Panthers formed. Black Panthers were an organization that 
the men are carrying weapons. It is a semi-militant group. Oh, and by the way, Ronald Reagan was governor of California at the time, and he put into place anti some anti-gun legislation when the Black Panthers started becoming militant. So that's interesting when he was a pro-NRA supporter. I think he had an A-plus rating by the NRA at that time. I think they were still using that. But anyway, so the Black Panthers were militant, but they were also um, feeding the poor. They were doing trainings um, for improvement. They were supporting the Black community. And I'm going to link uh, to the PBS channel a um, trailer for a documentary about the Black Panthers. And this was part of a black separatist movement. It's like, okay, fine. Y'all don't want integration? We'll give you not integration. And the Nation of Islam and the Black Panthers were, okay, let's support ourselves. If we're not going to be treated right, we'll treat ourselves right. And I like this picture of Malcolm X and um, Muhammad Ali. They were members of the Nation of Islam. And I just think this picture really nicely captures both of their senses of humor. They're, Malcolm X is seen as this powerful speaker, this angry man, but he had an amazing sense of humor that just gets lost under his speeches because he had a really powerful message. One of his most famous speeches is called The Ballot or the Bullet, where if we're not going to get to vote, we're going to take the right to vote. And listening to his speech is, it, it was angry and it had a right to be angry. But I don't think Malcolm X gets nearly enough credit for integration and the civil rights movement because he and the Black Panthers were angry. They were militant for good reason. But think about what this anger and militancy seen armed African Americans in New York, in California, in Chicago. What you're seeing, think about what that did to the moderate white voters. Well, we have on this side something that scares us, and we have Dr. King in his march in Washington saying, we can get along, we could live together. I have a dream that someday my children I mean it was a hopeful positive message and it was less scary so I think that this started pushing the voter block into integration this is my take on it if you would like to argue with me there's a comment section below at this time there were other things going on around the world we were still in the Cold War. The Cold War was horrible. But Kennedy, remember, wasn't the most militant person. He, we were doing the Bay of Pigs invasion. We, he had inherited a plan from Eisenhower in which we would train up Cuban dissidents that were um, expatriated. We were training them and we said we would give them support once they went and tried to take the island back from Castro. And then we didn't. And of course, the Cubans felt completely and utterly betrayed by this. The Cubans in Florida, I mean. And still to this day, there's a large percentage of the Cuban population that wouldn't even consider voting Democrat because of Kennedy's betrayal not sending in um, people to back up that Bay of Pigs invasion that we had put into place. So when they talk about the Florida Republican voting block, a lot of that, that today in politics, all these years later, is because of a decision Kennedy made. These historic decisions have consequences and they will keep having consequences. Mind you, a lot of the younger generation don't have that feeling they don't remember the Cold War. They don't remember it. So there are young Cubans that are now voting Democrat, but it's still there and with us. 
just the same way my generation doesn't remember Pearl Harbor, a lot of your generation doesn't remember the September 11th attacks. So it's not as tangible as shaping your personalities. Um, but besides that, we were fighting the Cold War through the Peace Corps and through Alliance for Progress, which was in Latin America, which is we're going to help poor developing nations, people, um, countries that haven't sided with the communists, the second world, or us, the first world yet, we're going to help them get infrastructure, um, clean water, better schools. We're going to help develop this infrastructure, and because they want to be friends with us, they're going to stay not communist. And this was a better decision than, say, the Korean War. And it's less costly to be nice than engage in war. So, 1961, um, the Alliance for Progress was established for economic cooperation between the United States and Latin America. Let's help them build up so they don't feel the need to go communist. Oh, there's so much to talk about, which we could discuss this in the Cold War lecture. I already mentioned a lot of it. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, there's a lot between us back and forth where Castro wanted to play nice with us and we said no. So he took land and offered to pay United Fruit. It's like, okay, I'm taking this land so the Cuban peasants don't have to be vassals on their own land. I will pay United Fruit and I'm expropriating this land for my people. We put an embargo in place because this was a no-go. United Fruit had a lot of political sway and they wanted to keep that property. So by us putting a sugar embargo, then Castro did, I think he um, then took um, Cuban ownership of the oil, which made us put another step into place against them. So then Cuba did something else, and then we did something else, and then Cuba, realizing that we're never going to play nice with them, got in bed with um, Khrushchev and the Soviet Union. He hadn't been affiliated with the Soviet Union to that point. The Soviet Union said, hey, this is a great place for us to put missiles. So they put nuclear weapons on the Cuban island, and you could see here that it would be very easy for them to bomb us. So it got really hairy. It was like one Russian ship captain who hesitated on pushing the button that kept us out of nuclear war. This one man's hesitation saved the world as we know it. So after that, Kennedy's like, yeah, you know what? I think things have gone a little bit too far. And he telephoned Khrushchev and they had a conversation. So I can't remember if it was a Poland or Turkey, but we had, we had nuclear weapons in areas that could also hit the Soviet Union and they had them um, in Cuba. So it was kind of the exact same situation. Khrushchev publicly took the missiles out of Cuba. If, this is the, this was a pinky swear between Kennedy and Khrushchev, we'll take our missiles out of that location. So we, they did that publicly. We, we only would do it secretly, but this was, it eased the tension a little bit. We intervened around the world, but we had a lot of reason to in our own backyard. We were afraid of another Cuba, so we were sending in military action. We were putting in troops in place so we didn't have any more communist governments getting near us. 
and we put a lot of money into keeping the new world free. <sighs> okay. We were becoming actively involved in Vietnam at this time. Once again, we wanted to make sure any country that had a democratically elected government that says, hey, will you please help us keep our capitalist system? We would send in men, we would send in supplies, we would send money to keep these areas from falling to communist. Um, this was actually a civil war. Well, the Vietnamese, it had originally been French into China. They had been a French colony. They didn't want to be a French colony. There was a lot of poverty, a lot of um, peasant farmers, and the communists were like, well, no, everybody will be treated equally if you come with us. And so... It was an uprising within, but because it had communist backing, we had to. Under the Truman Doctrine, we had to go in and fight this war. And it didn't go too well for us. Okay, I'm just going to read this. Much of Vietnam War was fought in small engagements in a widely scattered area. It did not conform to traditional notions of combat. There were traditional battles, but we didn't really know necessarily who was combatants and who wasn't. A lot of villages supported this so that the enemy could just blend into the villages. We didn't formally declare war. This, the Vietnam War really wasn't in that it wasn't declared. But Congress passed the Gulf of Tongan Resolution in 64, August, and the president was given leeway to conduct this. So Congress is the one that declares war, but um, yeah, it's so big. <laughs> and the problem, okay, quagmire just means getting stuck in stuff the swamp. Well, I need you to know this word, attrition. The war of attrition. Okay, you guys know how we won the um, Revolutionary War with, Pre with um, General Washington? We're, did we have better generals? Not really. Did we have more weapons? No. Did we have a stronger, better army? Not even close. This was our Revolutionary War was a war of attrition. England kept sending troops, kept sending weapons, kept sending everything until the English people got tired of spending this money and it became unpopular. That's the exact same thing that happened in Vietnam. It was going okay. First couple years, almost every war is first couple years okay. It's all right, It'll, we'll get past it. But then when the people are starting to feel a pinch of um, inflation, when they start feeling a pinch from higher taxation, when they start feeling at home that, you know, I could have it a lot better if we weren't fighting this war. That's when things start to go bad. People lose interest. They um, start getting angry that it's taking away from their personal comfort. So, all the Vietnamese had to do was wait till we got tired of it. All the um, Americans had to do, well, was wait till the English got tired of it. I mean, there's more to it than that, but that's basically what happened. And we got tired of this sooner than we would have because this was the first war in which we had cameramen. We could see those horrific pictures. Um, that little tiny, what? seven-year-old girl running naked being burned by napalm that started being on the evening news and it started making us really upset it's like we don't want to be a part of this 
and we started thinking, what if we're the bad guys? And that really started breaking the national psyche. So, and of course, our troops over there were 18, 19, 20 year old kids. And what, infantry training is what, eight weeks long? And okay, it teaches them hand-to-hand -hand combat. It teaches them how to shoot the weapons. But does it, does it desensitize them to being shot at? Does it desensitize them to anybody in a village could be the enemy? And so a lot of these kids were panicked. So even if the leader hadn't ordered a village destroyed, these young men were panicking and just killing. And when they came home, with this being on the news, they were treated even more horrifically. So they were, things were thrown at them, they were spit at. These veterans who had no say in whether they were going, because a good number of them were draftees who, unless they hid or fled to Canada, had no choice in the matter. We didn't treat people right on this one. So, the war started souring. We weren't terribly effective. They had underground tunnels. They could go to ground. So, yeah, a quagmire. This war of attrition. Anyone watch The Prince of His Bride? Never get involved in a land war in Asia. Well, no kidding. We, we can't ever put enough money into this. So, with that, there was that growing anti-war movement. Oh, the music at this time, and into the early 70s. The music coming out of this is spectacular. But, there's war-induced inflation, people weren't... there. So, if a loaf of bread costs 10 cents, a couple years later it costs 15 cents, your paycheck's not going to go as far, and people were starting to feel this pinch. So there was a growing opposition to the war. It, so Tet is um, the Lunar New Year in Vietnam. So in 68, the North Vietnamese and the Communist Viet Cong forces launched a coordinated attack. At, uh, and there was a number of targets in South Vietnam, but oh boy, did it hit us hard. And it's like people are saying, we're not going to be able to win this. It really shattered our confidence in this war. And remember, this was a time, until the mid-60s, we trusted our government. Um, Payola in the 50s, where um, record companies were paying radio stations to play their stuff, this was a scandal that really hurt us. We started mistrusting businesses. By the mid to late 60s, we started mistrusting our government, too. And there was just a decline in, tr in trust in general. That optimism we had was, a lot of it was gone by this point. Johnson says he's not going to run for another term, which probably was a wise move on his part because even the Democrats that had voted him in, they were protesting at the Democratic National Convention. It's like, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids do you kill today? It's like, okay, even his, a lot of his own party had turned on him. Bobby Kennedy, um, John F. Kennedy, also known as Jack Kennedy, by the way, don't know how they got the nickname, but Bobby Kennedy is going to run for president. So he was wildly popular. He wasn't the shining star that Jack was, but he still was pretty popular, and he very well could have won. But then... This was a horrible frickin' year. Um, Dr. King was assassinated, and there's a video. Bobby Kennedy was in an African-American community in a park giving a speech when he got word that Dr. King had just been assassinated. And he had to deliver this message to this crowd. It's like, I'm sorry. To inform you, Dr. King's been killed. And it's like, 
the the heartbreak and then the crowd just this huge gasp I'll see if I can link it on YouTube I'm not sure if I can find the full clip but it's just hit watching him give this speech oh yeah and like the year before that um, Malcolm X had been assassinated so 63 and then Malcolm X and I think this is 68 that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and then like a month or so later Sirhan Sirhan killed Bobby Kennedy can you imagine what's going on in people's minds with all these great leaders dying and then most families in the country either had somebody over in Vietnam or had friends or community members over fighting in Vietnam this was a hard time for our country And remember I mentioned the Dixocrats? Sorry, it wasn't Strom Thurmond, it was George Wallace that ran. So George Wallace ran as a disaffected Southern voter. How dare they put integration into this Democratic platform? We can't vote for this. So he look how many votes he pulled away from the Democrats. And Richard Nixon won handily. Of course, in the next election, Nixon started employing something called the Southern Strategy, in which, because the Democrats were always the pro-labor party. The Republicans have always been the pro-business party. But Nixon came in and said, yes, we understand your pain, dear Dixocrats. Come over here and be a Republican where the Democrats at this time saw that the African Americans were a huge um, voting block, but they were also a labor force, so it doesn't even change their policy. They're still pro-labor, and look who these laborers are. So this was distinctly just a shift in who they're recognizing as a voter block, not in policy overall. And these voter blocks, the Dixocrats, now are very solid Republican voting states. So all remember these repercussions. Integration policies and Southern anti-immigrationists shifted and caused these voter blocks where it was one party, now it's two parties. So, once again, I want you to remember, think of these repercussions, think of the repercussions of the civil rights movement and what that's done for our country. But the repercussions of the Jim Crow era are the ones that caused the civil rights. The repercussions of choices made in 16, 19, 16, 20 here in the colonies, what to do with, I think it was six or nine Africans that came here they were originally just going to be indentured servants and then it's like wait no we these aren't indentured servants they're now classified as slaves this choice by people several hundred years ago 400 years ago dictates what's going on today and is still with us so think about every historical move everything that happens how we handle this crisis and the economic slide that's going on right now will shape, no matter what we choose, will shape what's going to happen in the next 50 years, next 100 years. So I want you to think about these repercussions. We can see them because we have good documentation. A lot of us have lived these times. And we're going to show next um, lecture the 1970s when you guys will still see it as the hippie movement as the 1960s, but we see a continuation of this protest. They start getting bigger. They start getting stronger. So talk to you next week and thank you.